So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome on behalf of the United Nations Association of Connecticut and on behalf of the Faxton Library of West Hartford. Um, this is actually, uh, when I look out, this is the model of the United Nations right here in reality. It's an incredible, incredible experience. So I'd like to begin with a couple of things before I open with some remarks. The first is, I would like us to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the occupied territory of the Tungsis, Wanabuk, and Sikuag peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. As a second moment in preparation for beginning, there are quite a few tragedies going on in our planet at this point, whether we talk about the wars, the humanitarian crises of starvation, the millions of refugees around the world, many, many, many people who are victims, totally innocent, in the midst of these sufferings. And so I'd just like to take a quiet moment to, a minute of silence, just to hold in our hearts um, these unnamed individuals, men and women, who right now don't have this privilege um, and this quiet. Recently I participated in a conference at Bard College how to hold a civil conversation in dark times. And in some ways, in the midst of the dark times we experience within our, on our planet, nevertheless, when I think of Eleanor Roosevelt um, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, there is a beam of hope even in the midst of that darkness. And so, in some ways, our gathering is a way of seeking to affirm that hope uh, and to understand how we, in the midst of our own hope, may be able to, uh, to make a difference. One of the other elements is that uh, as an organization in Connecticut, we offer three scholarships um, to cover the state of Connecticut. There are scholarship applications and inf information about the scholarships. Fortunately, we have one of the ones who has been awarded that scholarship who's going to be reading today from Albania, who is with us. So just to let you know um, that this is something that we do, and I'm convinced that part of the trauma in our world is a failure of diplomacy. Ideally, the United Nations works towards developing diplomacy. I thought we would like to begin with the uh, some readings from the Universal Declaration <coughs> of Human Rights in just a diversity of languages to give us a sense of the cosmopolitan nature of uh, us as a people and of us as a world. There are many languages that will be represented. I actually did try to reach out to both to the Jewish community and the uh, Arabic community within the metropolitan Hartford area and uh, no one was available, so those two languages are not represented here. But there are many others that kind of reflect something of the diversity of the 193 nations that make up the United Nations. Perhaps we can begin, first of all, with the, um, a reading um, and the signing. Um, so I could ask Mary and Margot, please come up. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind, 
and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. Thank you. Mientras que el desagrado y el desprecio por los derechos humanos han dado lugar a actos bárbaros que han indignado a la conciencia de la humanidad y el adver, advenimiento de un mundo en que los seres humanos disfrutan de la libertad de expresión y creencias, de la libertad sin miedo ni miseria, que han sido proclamados por la más alta aspiración de la gente común. Thank you. If man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, human rights should be protected by the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Baxter. How many of you know Nepali language, understand Nepali language? I think I see two of you here in Nepal. Um, the text is a little different from that. Now I'm going to say to Rashtra Sanko, Asrema, Yutubiram, Nazika, Situ, the Ko Bisma, Smith, Sameko, Samanagade, Dosro Pisu, the Ko Shirabata, Utrin, Eleanor, Rosa, Kori Marule, Mano, the Kako, Nantish, the Contractor, the Napolagi, Maila Purusko, Zaki, Rashtiata, Dharma was, Hastritic, Christian Gumibata, Sutantra Pisoka, Harek, Desma, Manibi, Mariada, Samad Dari, Soka, Koruna, Adiko, Samad Darita, Say. Dr. Wilson Lee, Hartford Chatterson, Majorda, Radio Bosna, and Nirantar Rupma Sakar, Beko, Professor Garda, yes, please, Mr. Bowen, Mr. Lepers. Whereas the peoples of the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women, and have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. So, we're speaking in Hindi now. So, we are also going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. We are going to be able to do this. And we are going to be able to do this. And I will say another thing in the Gujarati language, which is spoken in some of the parts of uh, uh, India, in the Gujarat street. The United Nations in Lokoma, Samajma, Uttaratar Pragatakarva Mate, Gani. प्रयासो प्रयास हैं स्त्री पुरुष ना समान हक अने सामाजिक जीवन धोरण ऊंचे लावा माटे महत्तम कार्य करेगा छह थैंक यू सो मच नाथ सर एंड सामीद का हम अस्सलाम वालेकुम अगर इंसान को आहरी हल्के के तौर पर जुल्म और जबर के हलाल तो गावत करने पर मजबूर किया जाए कि इंसानी हकों का ताहफ़त कानून की इंतज़ामी से किया जाए जब कोमों के दरमियान दोस्ताना तलबात को फ़्रोक देना ज़रूरी है जब के अपोहमे मुहतदा के लोगों ने चार्टर में पुनियादी हकों इंसानी पुनियादी हकों इंसान की इज्जत और कदर मर्द और औरत के मसावी हकों में अपने ईमान की तस्दी की है और समाजी तरक्की और ज़िंदगी के पैतर मियार को फ़्रोक देने का अज़म किया है been one of the awardees from our scholarship, the United Nations Association. Um, she is studying at the uh, University of Connecticut at this point, and from Albania, and um, she is going to read this text. Whereas member states have pledged themselves to achieve, in cooperation with the United Nations, the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And whereas a common understanding of these rights and freedoms is of the greatest importance for the full realization of this pledge. Duke pasur për asyrë se shtetet antarë janë zotuar të arrim në bashkunime kome dhe bashkuara, promovimin e respektit universal dhe respektimit të të drejtave njërë të njërë liu dhe njërëve të melore, duke madhë gjithashtu për asyrë, kuptimin të melore të këture njërëve dhe importancen e të alësishme të respektimit të të betimi, Agora, portanto, a Assembleia Geral proclama a presente Declaração Universal 
dos direitos humanos como ideal comum a atingir por todos os povos e todas as nações, a fim que todos os indivíduos e todos os órgãos da sociedade, tendo-a constantemente no espírito, se esforcem pelo ensino e pela educação, por desenvolver o respeito desses direitos e liberdades e por promover prometidas progressivas da ordem nacional e internacional, o seu reconhecimento e a sua aplicação universais e efetivos, tanto entre as populações dos próprios Estados-membros, como entre as dos territórios colocados sob a sua jurisdição. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration, without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political jurisdiction or national status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, trust, non-self-governing, or under any other limitations of sovereign mind. Thank you. Mọi người đều được tất cả những quyền và tự do nêu trong bản tuyên ngôn này không phân biệt chủng tộc, màu da, giới tính, ngôn ngữ, tôn giáo, quan điểm chính trị hay các quan điểm khác, nguồn gốc quốc gia hay xã hội, tài sản, thành phần xuất thân hay địa vị xã hội. Ngoài ra, cũng không có bất cứ sự phân biệt nào về địa vị chính trị, pháp quyền hay quốc tế của quốc gia hay lãnh thổ mà một người xuất thân cho dù quốc gia hay lãnh thổ đó được độc lập, được đặt dưới chế độ ủy trị chưa tự quản hay có chủ quyền hạn chế. Tất cả mọi người sinh ra đều được tự do và bình đẳng về nhân phẩm và quyền. Mọi con người đều được tạo hóa ban cho lý trí và lương tâm và cần phải đối xử với nhau trong tình bằng thủ. Thank you. Tous les êtres humains naissent libres et égaux en dignité et en droit. Ils sont doués de raison et de conscience et doivent agir les uns envers les autres dans un esprit de fraternité. Chacun peut se prévaloir de tous les droits et de toutes les libertés proclamées dans la présente déclaration sans distinction aucune, notamment de race, d'opinion politique ou de toute autre opinion d'origine nationale ou sociale, de fortune, de naissance ou de toute autre situation. De plus, il ne sera fait aucune distinction fondée sur le statut politique, juridique ou international du pays ou du territoire dont une personne est ressortissante, que ce pays ou, ou territoire soit indépendant, sous tutelle, non autonome ou soumis à une limitation quelconque de souveraineté. No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery in the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. All are equal before the law, and all are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. All are entitled to an equal protection against any discrimination in violation of this declaration and against any incitement to such discrimination. Ο καθένας μας έχει το δικαίωμα στη ζωή, στην ελευθερία και στην προσωπική ασφάλεια. Κανένας δεν μπορεί να κρατηθεί στη σκλαβιά ή στην υποτέλεια. Η δουλεία και το δουλεμπόριο θα παγορεύονται σε όλες τις μορφές τους. Κανείς δεν πρέπει να υποβάλλεται σε βασανιστήρια ή σε σκληρή, απάνθρωπη, εξευτελιστική μεταχείριση ή τιμωρία. Ο καθένας έχει το δικαίωμα να αναγνωρίζεται παντού ως άτομο ενώπιον του νόμου. Όλοι είναι ίσοι ενώπιον του νόμου και δικαιούνται χωρίς καμία διάκριση, ίση προστασία από τον νόμο. Όλοι δικαιούνται ίση προστασία έναντι οποιασδήποτε διάκρισης 
αυτή τη διακήρυξη και ενάντια σε οποιαδήποτε υποκίνηση σε τέτοια διάκριση. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to welcome everyone here to this great event. This is 2023 United Nations Day celebration in Connecticut. It's the 75th anniversary of the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I am Dave Roberts, and I'm now the Vice President of the Connecticut Chapter of the United Nations Association. And I think this is a fabulous chapter. We love giving our scholarships every year and working on projects. When Dr. Baxter, our president, said we have to think about a guest speaker, I was studying to be a docent at the Salmonbrook Historical Society in Granby. And one of the guys said, you ought to consider Dr. Tracy Wilson. She's got her roots here in Granby. She's an icon in West Hartford and beyond. And she's just a great person. Her bio is in the program, so I'm not going to read it. But I just want to tell you a couple of things. First of all, I learned that her dad chaired the committee that I now serve on in Granby. Bob Wilson was the chair of the um, Zoning Board of Appeals that I now serve on in Granby. So that's kind of a cool connection. And she has a love of Eleanor Roosevelt. And I told her that that's why I thought this would be perfect, because many of us have a love and respect for the work of Eleanor Roosevelt above and beyond her husband who was our president. But in particular, in her bio it says, her teaching and research have centered on those whose human rights were not protected. So Eleanor Roosevelt has been a particular hero of hers. Thanks so much uh, for asking me to speak here at the United Nations Association of Connecticut program to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's a real honor to get a chance to speak about human rights and Eleanor Roosevelt. And thank you to Dave uh, from my hometown of Granby for inviting me and to President Joe Baxter for all his help in getting ready for t today. And thanks to Pramod uh, Pradhan uh, for all the arrangements and for the community he builds here at the library. In October 2023, the words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights ring in our ears as we take in the wars in Israel, Gaza, and Ukraine, the mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine. We learn of refugees, border walls, experience racism, the persecution of LGBTQ plus individuals, we hear autocrats who believe they're above the law and learn of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. Ellen Roosevelt, who in 1946 had little international experience, led a 16-person committee that wrote this Universal Declaration of Human Rights between 1946 and 1948. She felt this committee could help the United Nations achieve its primary objective of keeping the peace of the world by helping human beings to live together happily and contentedly. These two women, who came from very different backgrounds, supported each other as powerful political servants, as world travelers and international citizens, uh, people who grew women's leadership, and people who supported human rights. Their relationship and their activities belie the image of women in the 1950s retreating to their homes and putting all their energy into their families. The Women's Service Bureau uh, that Auerbach started, and I'll talk uh, more about it later, helped educate and build women's leadership and promote an interdependent world. This organization drew these two women together and they began a friendship that lasted from 1946 to 1962 when Eleanor Roosevelt died. The Connecticut Museum of Culture and History holds a correspondence of 180 letters between them. These two women had much in common. When they met, Auerbach was 59, Roosevelt 62. I think the two women were in the same room in November 1940, when each was singled out by suffragist Carrie Chapman, Chapman Catt, who organized the Women's Centennial Congress at the Astor Hotel in New York City, 
to celebrate a century of female pra progress. Imagine Auerbach's pride to be part of this gathering of women leaders led by, um, but I guess you can't read this, but uh, she's listed as Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, and then Auerbach is listed over here. Okay. The formation of the United Nations in 1945 was a reaction to many things. The failure of the League of Nations after World War I, the horrors of the Holocaust and the Second World War. Leaders called for an international organization to maintain international peace, practice tolerance, and to be good neighbors, and promote economic and social progress for all people. President Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt planned to go to the first meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco in June of 1945, but FDR died in April and Eleanor did not go on her own. The United Nations and Mrs. Roosevelt's task uh, to lead a committee to write a Declaration of Human Rights kicked off her last career and the 17 years of her widowhood are known as her human rights years. Um, and for those of you who are sort of history buffs, this is uh, John Dulles and Adlai Stevenson with her. In December 1945, President Harry Truman tapped Eleanor Roosevelt to be a U.S. representative to the first delegate meeting of the United Nations. Eleanor was the only woman in the U.S. delegation in this London meeting held in January 1946. She was appointed to Committee 3, which was thought to be a minor committee. She was the woman, and uh, she would be put on a minor committee, which ended up addressing these issues. Refugees and displaced persons, relief and rehabilitation of war-ruined communities, drafting of an international accord on human rights, how to return dislocated populations to their countries of origins. She was a principal in the work of all four of these issues, she helped to create the International Refugee Organization, the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, and UNICEF. She made her greatest contribution when she was appointed chair of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. So putting her on a minor committee sort of backfired on <laughs> As the United Nations began to do its work to get countries to use diplomacy instead of war, World events showed that this would not be easy, but in fact was necessary. In an early February 1946 speech, Stalin said that peaceful coexistence between communism and capitalism was impossible. In mid-February, George Kennan, chargé d'affaires in Moscow, sent a long telegram from Moscow saying the US needed to meet Stalin with strength. And in March, Former Prime Minister Winston Churchill spoke at Westminster College in Missouri and warned of Soviet ambitions in his Iron, uh, Iron Curtain speech. This is the context in which Eleanor Roosevelt arrived in Hartford on April 10, 1946 as a guest of Beatrice Fox Auerbach and the Women's Service Bureau. She spoke at Centennial Hall uh, this was in the uh, department store, some of you may know, I think on the 11th floor, uh, on Main Street in downtown Hartford. Her task, according to the Hartford Current article, which you can't really see, but it's there, uh, was to tell the women of Connecticut about the worldwide organization that now is seeking to develop the foundation stones for peace. In the evening, uh, in the evening, she addressed the 1946 Hartford Jewish Federation campaign at a meeting at the Bushnell Memorial with the title, This is what I saw, explaining the need for relief for Jews in Europe. This, the talk at Sentinel Hill Hall was sponsored by the Women's Service Bureau. Auerbach Service Bureau established a statewide nonprofit educational service to assist women's voluntary organizations in planning and running their own programs and developing among their members leadership, perception, and understanding in areas of their interest. Their main issues for the organization were to educate women, to teach about international relations, and to support, support child health. 
1945, her organization went live, and in 1945, our back endowed it with six million dollars. So imagine that in 1949. By 1965, the organization had office space at the store, a nine-woman staff provided assistance, consultation, and information to individuals and organizations. She was very interested in high school and college students. The Sentinel Hill Teen Club offered a regular planned program to over 1,500 girls, all funded by her foundation. Eleanor Roosevelt spoke um, at least six times for this organization. Getting, getting Eleanor Roosevelt to speak just three months after her work as a delegate in London really meant something. By April 9th, she had been asked by the UN's newly formed Economic and Social Council to serve on a nine-person, what they call a nuclear commission, charged with making recommendations concerning the structure and function of the Permanent Commission on Human Rights as envisioned in the UN Charter. Their first meeting was April 29th, just 20 days away, and when the meetings began, they declared Eleanor to be chair of the committee to write the Declaration of Human Rights. When Eleanor Roosevelt got to Hartford on April 9th, she knew of the grave situation in which the Universal Declaration would be born. Auerbach said that Roosevelt was there, uh, was here to represent the United Nations, an organization that for all its imperfections is the most practical approach to world brotherhood yet devised by man. Roosevelt spoke on the international approach to social, humanitarian, and cultural questions evolving from her work on UN committees. She emphasized the particular role of women to build cooperation among nations for the, what she said, the feminine influence for, for peace, if wisely used, can be really effective." Unquote. Those in the Women's Service Bureau had a lot of opportunities to learn about the United Nations. In later years, many Service Bureau members attended sponsored trips to the United Nations. This speaking engagement was the start of a friendship that lasted for 16 years. This is the first of 180 letters that exist between the two women between 1946 and 1962. This invitation came four weeks after Eleanor spoke at Hartford. This first personal invitation for lunch led to many more talks for the, uh, for the Service Bureau, visits to Our Farm and Tanglewood together, overnight stays in Hartford at Our Farm and in New York City. Uh, I don't know, if, uh, so this is uh, Valkill where they would have had lunch. Uh, says, I shall be very happy to have you drive over to Hyde Park for lunch with me on May 22nd at one o'clock. And if you care to bring anyone with you, I shall be glad to have them also. Very cordial yours. And she greeted her as dear Mrs. Auerbach. As their friendship began, Eleanor was in the midst of leading the UN Human Rights Commission, whose meetings began on Monday, April 29, 1946, at Hunter College in New York City. After three weeks of meetings with six of the nine members of the committee present, their one decision was to write the Bill of, the Bill of Human Rights. In the middle of the committee convening, she wrote the invitation for Auerbach to meet May 22nd for lunch. I imagine at their lunch that Auerbach and Roosevelt did talk about human rights and international relations. Auerbach did not just talk about international relations. She felt that traveling and international exchanges of women leaders helped to build, build cross-cultural connections. As Eleanor said, there is a particular role of women to build cooperation. This page from Auerbach's guest book in October 1946 boasts visitors from Nagoya City, Japan, Johannesburg, South Africa, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Czechoslovakia, Montevideo, Uruguay, Colombo, Ceylon, Rome, Italy, and Paris, France. She welcomed these women to her store and to Sentinel Hill Hall, where she ran many programs, and she welcomed many to the farm during the summer months. So this is Auerbach's uh, personal guest book. Uh, Auerbach had invited Roosevelt to attend the uh, October gathering that brought so many people from around the world to Hartford, but this reply 
show why Roosevelt could not attempt. And she says, the United Nations Assembly will be in session. Auerbach was aware of the role Roosevelt played in the UN. In 1947, she sent this scarf to her. This is known as a UN scarf. Roosevelt's role in crafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights put her squarely in the middle of the Cold War. She said, the whole struggle between democracy and totalitarianism acquits itself in a world in which we are playing for very high stakes. Russia has made one valuable contribution. It has kept before us the failure of de democracy. Roosevelt emphasized that the battleground is here in the United States, only as we show, not talk, but show that actually here democracy exists, and where we fail, that we are really making an effort to change, will we win the moral victory. The Soviets continued to publicize a lack of civil rights for black Americans here segregation that existed, the lack of voting rights and violence toward returning soldiers. Eleanor was aware of this hypocrisy and used it to encourage more attention to civil rights. And she would always say, we are making progress, uh, which in 1948 was a little bit of a tough statement to make, uh, but uh, that was a, a real issue. Roosevelt said one of the reasons that it took so long to complete the declaration at the assembly was because of certain phrases like everyone or human being instead of men that were unacceptable to some countries. Just these three words took four weeks to agree to. The second woman delegate on the 16 person committee you can see here is a woman named Hansa Mehta from India and she had protested for independence with Gandhi and was a political leader in India. She is widely credit, she's widely credited with changing the phrase, all men are born free and equal, which is Article 1, to all human beings are born free and equal. Many more women ensured that the words used included all and everyone rather than men. Um, it was interesting, this wasn't particularly an issue for Eleanor Roosevelt. She used the word men and she said it means everyone. Uh, but there were women in the 1940s who were saying, no, it doesn't. Uh, so in Article 2, there, there's uh, particular interest in this on gender equality. Article 16, the rights of marriage. Article 23, equal pay for equal work. Eleanor Roosevelt cited the passing of the Declaration as a victory for the moral view of individual freedom. She did not want to take credit for her leadership of the Commission on Human Rights, but others, like the New York Times, uh, gave her credit. The New York Times, December 13, 1948, called it what it was, Eleanor Roosevelt's victory. Roosevelt said, uh, the UN cannot assure peace, but only work to create the climate that makes peace a better choice than war. Many thought uh, Roosevelt was just a figurehead on this committee. It was accurate to say that those forming this committee knew that when the League of Nations was not ratified by the US after World War I, its power was diminished. By centering the U UN in the US and using the powerful Roosevelt name, world leaders thought it would help to ensure the UN's success. Yet Eleanor was much more than that. She navigated the beliefs and points of view from the 16 on the committee to produce this document. Just about a month after the Declaration of Human Rights was declared on December 10, 1948, Roosevelt was back in Hartford. On January 19, 1949, Roosevelt spoke to the Women's Service Bureau at Sentinel Hill Hall as part of the Bureau's series of meetings devoted to international relations. A thousand people came to hear her, including eight girls chosen from area high schools. Before her speech, she was interviewed at the home of Beatrice Fox Auerbach on Prospect Avenue, and some of you may recognize that. It's about four houses north of the governor's mansion. Uh, and, and in this interview, she said, women are the watchdogs of peace. She said that women can influence world peace because they have a natural desire to crusade. They are not bound by tradition. They are not trained to settle differences by force. And they are more conscious of the moral, spiritual, and social forces. 
She, said, she stated that women can, on certain subjects, come to an understanding with other women on a world level and work together as they are more willing to sacrifice. She explained that the declaration was a statement of goal and not international law. At her talk that evening, Eleanor Roosevelt spoke about the importance of democracy working in the United States. She said Russian delegates reminded her of every small happening which indicated that democracy is not working in America. Uh, and as I said before, civil rights were some of the main critiques. She said the battleground is here in the US only as we show not talk but show that actually here dem democracy exists, where we fall, that we are really making an effort to change, where we win the moral victory. <coughs> Uh, Roosevelt met afterwards with a group of high school and college students. She said the UN was fighting important battles against famine and disease, especially tuberculosis. She said the United Nations cannot assure peace, but only work to create the climate. Auerbach also did much in her power to create a climate where women could talk about important human rights issues. Roosevelt's ideas of creating a climate, we might say a context for talking about human rights, is so important to us today. A year and a half later, in this letter of September 21st, 1951, Auerbach writes to Roosevelt before Eleanor goes off to Paris and India. Beatrice herself is planning a nine-week trip to Lebanon, Egypt, India, Pakistan, and Kashmir and asked Mrs. Roosevelt for letters of introduction. In a subsequent letter, we find out that Roosevelt sent three letters of introduction and had gotten her in touch with the Pakistani ambassador. This letter shows the depth of friendship uh, between the two women. Uh, and uh, Auerbach says here, once again, my heartfelt and deepest thanks for all that you have done and are doing for youth, democracy, and for your many personal friends, among whom I am immodest enough to include myself. <laughs> Beatrice was impressed with the goodwill which Roosevelt's journey to South Asia created. Eleanor Roosevelt went on to invite Auerbach to the UN building for lunch in May 1953 and to meet her in conference room three. In 1956, the Service Bureau held their annual meeting. This conference drew 350 women, and when you looked at the statistics about these meetings, they would always say, we had a woman from every town in the state of Connecticut, so they were really about organizing women around the, the state. Uh, and Eleanor Roosevelt was a featured speak speaker. There were programs on refugees in Pakistan, uh, talk about two United Nations trips, a talk on Southeast Asia, Berea College, a look at colonialism, and two programs called A Look at the World. Photos show participants from Germany, Britain, Israel, Denmark, and a woman on a panel from the National Council of Negro Women speaking about women and freedom with John Oakes of the New York Times and a professor from Harvard. This organization was clearly an avenue for Auerbach to push her human rights agenda and develop a climate where human rights could flourish. This is, I know the second time you've seen it, but it's one of those fo photos where I say, I wish I was there. Yeah. Uh, it seems like Mrs. Auerbach is telling a joke to the First Lady and to Chase Go and Woodhouse, the director of the Women's Service Bureau from the 1950s through the 1980s. Woodhouse served two terms as Connecticut, Connecticut Secretary of State in the 1940s, two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives in the late 40s and early 50s, and Eleanor Roosevelt actually campaign, campaigned for her. She was an economics professor at Connecticut College, an author, a political activist, and a mother of two. Her obituary read, she was an ardent supporter of the United Nations. Six months before its establishment in 1945, she said, enduring peace can be achieved only by the peoples of the earth associating themselves in an international organization, forming an international community in which each has rights but also responsibilities to help make certain that peace and justice are supreme in the world. She said this as a member of the House of Representatives <coughs> and a friend of Beatrice Fox Auerbach. As I study these women, these women, I see them working on issues of global understanding as they supported one another. 
This is the height of the Cold War, and for Beatrice, it was a time to travel countries caught up in this Cold War. So, um, oh wait, I think I'm not supposed to switch yet. Uh, this was a time to invite visitors across the world to home experiences here in Connecticut. Members of the Service Bureau listened to guest speakers from Nigeria, Tunisia, East and West Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sudan, Nepal, and Turkey. The largest number of international visitors in 1966 came from the Philippines, Korea, India, Venezuela, Thailand, and Iran. According to the 1966 report, among the more unusual visitors were two Afrikaners, a minister and his wife from the Union of South Africa. They had been studying right-wing organizations in the United States. The Service Bureau arranged an afternoon meeting for them with five black leaders of Hartford. It was an enlightening afternoon for both sides and the only time the visitors had had an opportunity for a realistic discussion of racial tension in the United States. To me, this is living out the spirit of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and building a climate of understanding. Our back at Woodhouse lived this life of international understanding. They took six trips together, each at least four weeks in length. And this last one, when our back was 72 years old, um, the first trip she took to Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Iran, Transjordan, and Israel, uh, she and Chase, uh, she has a whole diary about it. They had 15 suitcases they took with them on this trip. Uh, but this is a year after Israel has declared its independence. So there's Palestinian refugees she encounters. And uh, it's really fascinating uh, to read about this, uh, about this trip. So she has diaries that she sent back to her, uh, letters she sent back to her grandchildren uh, about each of these trips. Uh, this entry from the guest book at Our Farm in 1960 said, to a dear friend with thanks and deep admiration and warm love, Eleanor Roosevelt. The Our Farm Retreat, 1040 Prospect, and Sentinel Hill Hall were places to entertain, learn, and network with friends and visitors from around the world. What united these women was their abiding interest in the ideals of democracy and how citizens could learn how to actively participate in a democratic society. They believed in the dignity of every individual. Beatrice did much to humanize those who worked for her, those who visited, and those who helped to build women leaders. These women spent their lives in the public world, something different from our image of women in the 1950s. Their stories need to be told and retold. Their system building, global understanding, public speaking, and work for the common good built a rich foundation for the women's movement in the 1960s. Many of us see Eleanor Roosevelt as an icon, and in the Hartford area, our back is that as well. It is also power to think of, powerful to think of them as two of many women committed to make the world a place of peace and understanding as outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, thank you everyone for coming. It's a great event. A lot of hard work went into this, so again, thank you to everyone who organized. It's a really great event. So I serve on the National Council. I'm one of two regional representatives from New England. And Medina's is my colleague from the Massachusetts area. And so events like these UN Day celebrations are happening all across the country. And it's one of the goals of the National Council is to make sure that every single chapter has the resources they need, the advocacy they need. We work with human agencies, nonprofits, local and federal lawmakers to make sure that the chapters and the organization run as fluently as it possibly can. And so to see all of you gathered here today, all the work begins to manifest itself, um, shows that all the hard work really does pay off. And that the National Council is here, not just to represent the regions that they represent, but any chapter anywhere, any UN foundation anywhere, to make sure that the goals of the UN are actualized in real time. And so I wanted to speak about, across all the UN gatherings this week, um, we've lost certain UN staff members in areas of conflict around the world specifically in Gaza, the Middle East, and other regions. And as we celebrate the UN Day celebrations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think it's appropriate to remember the lives of the people that we've lost who have given the ultimate sacrifice to make sure that all of these grand goals and ambitions can be actualized. And so these are men and women from all across the world. 
who have gone into some of the worst areas of conflicts known to man to provide food, water, medicine, and have ultimately paid the ultimate price. And so as we think about these goals and how they're actualized, and there's real faces of the real people amongst this world who serve and make the ultimate sacrifice to make sure that the world we wish to make can become a reality. And it is because of their hard work that this world can be a better place and that human, humans are good people in the end, despite conflict and uncertainty around the world. So thank you so much for coming. On behalf of the National Council and on the board, we thank you all. So. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start by dedicating this discussion to a young woman that lost her life to domestic violence last year, uh, Caroline Ashworth. Freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. That's a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt in the uh, Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, why we are all here today. And I'm here today to speak because I am not free from fear and want. So my name is Ashley Fawn. I am a single mom. I am a nonprofit founder, a grassroots nonprofit founder for an anti human trafficking organization. But there once was a time where I was a long term domestic violence victim. Well, before I had my daughter, I was a strangulation victim. Um, I know that seems hard to believe because I speak here with confidence and loud and sometimes people say I can be aggressive myself but those are all kind of defense mechanisms from the um, the experiences that I have been through. This was in 2014 uh, I had been experiencing long-term intimate partner um, violence and I finally was ready to leave. So which is the hardest thing that's the hardest thing for a domestic violence victim is to say I'm, I'm ready to leave. And I called the police. I called the police because I needed proof. I needed documentation. I needed that, that piece of paper, that incident report, so that I could use the resources, the nonprofits actually, that were there to help me. Um, so when I called the police, I, I poured my heart out to this one police officer. I was not somebody that had dealt with police often, um, so I just, told him everything. I said, you know, I'm a long-term domestic violence victim. I, I just need documentation so that I can leave this situation. And this is when I went from being the victim to becoming a villain. I was shocked that this police officer from my hometown called me crazy. He told me he wasn't going to document anything. Um, and he walked out the door. So, I made the decision to leave an abuser, and I was re-victimized by someone that was supposed to protect and serve. I spent the next three months reporting this police officer to Internal Affairs, to his supervisor, who also called me crazy and said that he wasn't going to document anything either. After the three months went by, I ended up becoming homeless. Um, Brantford Police made me a criminal myself. I ended up getting a criminal record for disorderly conduct, supervised by that same initial officer that took the report. I lost everything. I lost my entire storage unit that had all of my clothes and everything ready to go once I was, you know, found housing to, to get myself back on my feet. I lost my car. Um, I, it was the middle of the winter and I had to ride the bus to stay warm. I had to use public libraries to brush my teeth. It was a really, really sad moment for somebody that grew up in a wealthy shoreline town, went to Fairfield University, and didn't have a phone to call a friend. So now I stand here today saying that I'm this powerful nonprofit founder, domestic violence survivor, and advocate for sex trafficking victims. I have to put on this facade of being 
being strong, and it's, it's not really a facade. I am strong in some ways, but when I drive through my hometown, I shake. I'm shaking a little bit now, speaking about it, because I'm still not free from fear or wants, because Sergeant Kineski, that first responding officer, is still wearing a uniform. Thank you. Um, I hope all of you picked up the UDHR booklet on the back table. I have to tell you one of the many great reasons to join the Connecticut chapter of the United Nations Association is to learn. I had never heard of the UDHR. When we were having a meeting recently, um, a teacher from New York that belongs to our United Nations Lions Club says this is actually taught in fifth grade in public school. It definitely wasn't taught here in Connecticut in my public school, and I was just astounded to hear that. And so it's something that I think all of us need to think about, go back to our communities, and ask our Board of Educations, why isn't this taught? But I took a little bit different tact on the assignment when it came up at the board meeting. And for those that have your um, little booklets, on page 13 is Article 16. And Article 16 has to do with marriage and family. And I was talking to Dr. Wilson, kind of bragging about being a 13th generation resident, 13th generation resident of Connecticut. We're all immigrants, whether we came just recently or whether we came 13 generations ago. And one of the things that I never realized growing up here in Northwestern Connecticut was that I couldn't marry the person that I wanted to. It was against the law. And it was just astounding. And we hear about people and rights and experiences. And so Article 16, when you look at the book, most of the 30 articles in the Declaration begin with gender-free language. Dr. Wilson talked about that. Everyone, all, no one. But Article 16 is different. It states that men and women have the right to marry, with the women drafters of the UDHR succeeding in their determination to spell out clearly that women had equal rights in marriage. And for all you young people, that's anybody under 60 here, <laughs> women in my lifetime have not had equal rights in marriage and this is a new phenomenon for many people but they wanted to make sure and some people have interpreted this to say that marriage is between a man and a woman and most scholars agree that's not what this means and so in my personal story i grew up here in connecticut um, my very first job was to work in the Pentagon. I had a top secret special compartmentalized clearance. And one of the questions they ask you, are you a homosexual? How do you answer that in the early 1980s? And so I eventually decided to move to the great state of California in 1997. And in 1999, California decided to pass a law that basically gave the same rights and benefits of marriage as marriage, and it was called California Domestic Partnership. Well, my, at the time, partner and I, we've been together 25 years now, we decided that we wanted to start a family. And sometimes people of the same sex don't have a lot of options to start a family. So we decided that we were going to adopt. And so we adopted our first son in 2000. He was five years old. And a couple years later, he asked us why we weren't married. And so I talked to my partner about it. And I said, we ought to register for domestic partnership. So we eventually registered for domestic partnership. In 2004, Massachusetts became the first state to legalize same-sex marriage, and in 2008, California legalized same-sex marriage. 
the irony of it was we were domestic partners and our partnership anniversary was July 1st. Well, because of my job, I traveled a lot. And so I called up the county of San Diego and I said, do you and your partner have to be in the same room to get married in California? And they said, it sure would help. Why is your partner in the military? And I said, no, he's just traveling right now. And so they said, well, you really should be in the same room at the same time. So our marriage anniversary is actually July 2nd. Our domestic partnership is July 1st and our marriage anniversary is July 2nd. So we actually get two days to celebrate. It wasn't until 2015 that all 50 states finally had um, marriage equality for everyone. And so I bring this to you because 75 years ago, a bunch of women were talking and they said women should have equality in marriage. And now 75 years later, at least currently, everyone has a right to marry who they want. But it's so important for all of us to be active in our local communities, our states, our nation, and all over the world to protect these rights for all people for all times. Thank you. We uh, have an honorary uh, membership in our United Nations Association of Connecticut uh, for you for a year and uh, uh, something for your favorite charity and little tidbits just to say uh, thank you so much for this extraordinary opportunity to come together today and uh, your insights and reminding us, you know, not only of Eleanor, but of the Eleanor that is in each of us, you know, the possibilities that each of us has to uh, make a difference. So thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you.